Hello and greetings from the Bronx. This is Dr. Ronald Wharton. I am an assistant professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and an attending cardiologist at Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York. And I'd like to share an interesting case which came to my attention a few months ago. Is the PA pressure high or is it low? Now, first, I should tell you that I think this is a very interesting case. However, I don't have a confirmed established diagnosis yet, but I still thought that was worth exploring the physiology nonetheless. So this is an echocardiogram that I read on a 61-year-old woman. She had had a coronary bypass a few years previously, and she had had a number of, electric, of echocardiograms over the past couple of years that had demonstrated varying degrees of slowly increasing pulmonary hypertension. She's a non-smoker, which is something I gleaned from the chart. I've never actually met this patient myself. And you can see here in the first image which I'm providing, this is a RV inflow view with color Doppler. You can see that there is a moderate tricuspid regurgitation jet. And here's the Doppler. The TR velocity is a little more than 3.5 meters per second. That usually translates to a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of about 60 millimeters of mercury, assuming the mean RA pressure is about 10 millimeters of mercury. Nothing particularly exotic here. You'll notice um, upon inspection that the RV looked somewhat dilated. Other than that, there's nothing particularly unusual about a TR jet with velocity of three and a half meters per second. So why is the pulmonary artery systolic pressure high? Here we see a parasternal long axis view. You can see that the aortic valve is a little thickened, opens normally. <clears throat> the left ventricle is not dilated. You can see in this view that the right ventricle is dilated during diastole. In fact, you can't even see the entire RV. The mitral Leaflets are a little thickened, but open normally. When we put color on the same image, you can see that there's trivial aortic regurgitation and no mitral regurgitation to speak of. If you look very closely in the sector, you'll see something else, which I'll come back at later. Here we have an apical four-chamber view. And you'll see that the left ventricle looks normal in size, and they don't appear to be any regional wall motion abnormalities. The mitral valve is opening normally. The left atrium is either normal or borderline dilated, no more than that. The right atrium looks normal. However, the RV is at least moderately dilated. Here is the pulse wave Doppler through the mitral valve. You can see that the deceleration time of the E wave is 230 milliseconds. E is slightly larger than A. This is the lateral mitral annular tissue Doppler with a velocity of 12.4 centimeters per second, which I think anyone would agree is fairly robust and suggests good LV relaxation. So what do we have so far? The pulmonary artery systolic pressure is elevated. The right ventricle is dilated. However, it appears to function normally. You'll notice that there was no RV systolic dysfunction. The left ventricle appears to be normal in size and both systolic and diastolic function, and there do not appear to be any abnormalities with either the mitral or the aortic valve. So why is the pulmonary artery systolic pressure high? Well, let's take a look at some of the images again. The TR jet here is 440 milliseconds wide. That's not particularly unusual at all. But here's something that's interesting. The flow here, and I didn't show this yet, the flow here across the pulmonic valve has a width of 360 milliseconds, and the acceleration time of that flow is 110 milliseconds. The acceleration time is the time that's measured between the onset of flow through the pulmonic valve and the peak velocity. Now, normally, when the pulmonic vascular resistance is very high, the acceleration time goes down, and significant pulmonary hypertension is usually seen with an acceleration time closer to 70 or 80 milliseconds, not 110. That happens because when the pulmonary vascular resistance is high, the right ventricle has to waste a lot more time getting enough 
getting up enough energy to open up the pulmonic valve. So the isovolumic contraction time of the right ventricle goes up at the expense of the ejection time. Or put another way, the peak velocity happens at the same time, but the flow starts later, and therefore the acceleration time is diminished. So what's unusual here is that despite the presence of at least moderate pulmonary artery systolic hypertension, given the duration of the tricuspid regurgitation jet of 440 milliseconds and the duration of the flow through the pulmonic valve, which is 360 milliseconds, the RV T index calculates to the quantity 440 minus 360, which is 80, over 360, which is 0 0.22, which is normal. Now, just to refresh, of course, the T index, or also referred to, which is also referred to as the index of myocardial performance, is the ratio of the isovolumic times divided by the ejection period. It can be calculated by taking the entire duration of the MR jet on the left or the TR jet divided on the, on the right, divided by the duration of flow across the respective semilunar valve, depending on whether you're in the aortic or the pulmonic position. Normally, the RVT index is no more than 0 0.28, and when there is significant pulmonary vascular uh, hypertension, uh, the RVT at T index goes up enormously. We all know that clinically when we see that in the states of acute pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle dilates very, very rapidly, um, and the flow across the pulmonic valve takes much longer to start, as I mentioned before. So this suggests that despite the presence of pulmonary artery systolic hypertension, the ejection period is still not being sacrificed to the isovolumic contraction period. And that's what you usually see when any pulmonary hypertension is happening because of a primary increase in the pulmonic vascular resistance. So let's take another look at an image that we saw before. Here again is a close-up of the parasternal long axis that I showed initially. And you notice in the upper right corner there's a very significant turbulent jet in diastole coming right at the transducer. That jet is a pulmonic insufficiency jet, and it was there at the very, very beginning. Sometimes people notice it when the color sector is put on the aortic mitral valves, and sometimes they don't because it's usually found there as an incidental finding. The sonographer is usually not looking for it there. So now let me show you what the color flow looks like through the pulmonic valve. This is the short axis parasternal view through the aortic valve, at the aortic valve level. And here's the flow through the RVOT, through the pulmonic valve. You'll notice that the RV systolic function, as we mentioned before, is brisk, is good, because you can see that the color flow across the pulmonic valve is brisk, and that there is a very prominent regurgitant flow with a large piezo radius in diastole coming from the main pulmonary artery into the RVOT. Here is the continuous wave Doppler through the pulmonic valve. The peak velocity is 3 meters per second, but look at the end diastolic velocity. It's barely more than 1 meter per second. So the fact that the end diastolic velocity through the pulmonic valve in the PI jet is only one, oh, slightly more than 1 meter per second suggests that the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure is normal because when there's pulmonary artery diastolic hypertension, there's a gradient between the pulmonary artery and the RV at the end of diastole. But here, that jet is only about one meter per second. And also notice that on the continuous wave Doppler, the density of the PI signal is almost that of the, the forward or the antegrade flow through the pulmonic valve. So when we take everything together, we have pulmonary artery systolic hypertension, but we have a normal pulmonary artery diastolic pressure, or in other words, we have a very large pulse pressure in the pulmonary artery. Now, systemically, when we see a large pulse pressure, we all always think about severe aortic insufficiency. What I think is going on here is that this is all because of severe pulmonic insufficiency, and that explains why you have pulmonary artery systolic hypertension, but yet the things that we usually see when the pulmonary vascular resistance is the primary cause, namely a high RVT index or a short acceleration time through the pulmonic valve, isn't there. Why? Well, 
I suggested to the referring cardiologist that he get a follow-up study like an MRI or a TE or something, but he hasn't done that yet. Now, there are rare dysmorphic congenital pulmonic valves. There's also a well-described condition in older women called idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery, which can lead to pulmonic valve annular dilatation and secondary pulmonic regurgitation. Now, I have this next slide from another case where we had a patient who had precisely that problem, and this is a transesophageal echocardiogram where you can see uh, the aortic valve in the middle and the pulmonic valve at about 5 o'clock and a humongous, for lack of a better word, pulmonary artery. So this condition does exist. If I ever get a definitive diagnosis, I'll let you know, but she's not my patient. I just read her echo. In any case, I hope you found this informative, enjoyable, uh, a good review of the physiology of pulmonary hypertension on echo, especially if some of you out there are studying for echo boards. Uh, and again, this is uh, Dr. Ronald Wharton from Montefiore Medical Center, Bronx, New York, on the heart.org at Medscape. And thank you for tuning in.